Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar titled Let It Flow, How Flow Cytometry Improves Probiotic Testing Reliability. I'm very excited today to have a panel of presenters here with me. I am joined by Ellie Abraham, Dave Roth, and Anjay Benkowski. I am Amy Nock, and I will be moderating today's session. Before we begin, I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about how the webinar will be run. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation today to answer any viewer submitted questions that you may have. During the webinar, you can submit your questions using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions anytime throughout the webinar. That concludes my very brief introduction today. Ellie, I will now pass the presentation over to you. You may begin. Okay, great, Amy. Thank you for that introduction. As mentioned, we will be talking about how flow cytometry can improve probiotic testing reliability. And I will be starting off by giving a brief overview of what flow cytometry actually is and how we can use it for probiotic enumeration. But first I wanna make sure we're all on the same page on what probiotic enumeration is. This is the method for counting the number of cells in a probiotic sample, and it directly supports your potency claims. And this is a method that's necessary for brands, manufacturers, and raw ingredient suppliers. If you're a brand making a product, you need to know how many cells are in a serving size so you can have the correct potency on your label. If you're a manufacturer, you need to know how much of your raw ingredient to put in a product, as well as what you're finishing with when you get the final product. And if you're a raw ingredient supplier, it's important to test for probiotic counts between batch to batches to make sure you don't have too much variability between your samples. So why test? Let's say you're a brand making a probiotic product and you bought a dry probiotic powder from a manufacturer. When you buy this from the raw ingredient supplier, they tell you how many colony forming units or CFUs are in the powder by weight. So then you can use that to calculate how much to add to your product. But no matter how trustworthy your raw ingredient supplier is, there's always conditions that can change the amount of colony forming units that end up in your final product. This includes processing and packaging, both with the probiotic powder itself and your final product, formulation, as well as storage and transportation. And we'll be talking about later in this presentation how different conditions can change the final count in your product. And ultimately, the FDA can always ask for proof. If you're making a potency claim on your label, it's important to have proof of testing to back up those claims um, to meet the regulations. And probiotic enumeration is necessary to ensure that you have accurate potency claims, both so that consumers are getting the amount of bacterial cells they want in a product and that you're meeting regulations and guidelines. The traditional approach to probiotic testing is a plate count method. With a plate count method, you take your probiotic powder and you put it in a solution, and then you serial dilute until you're able to count individual colonies on a plate. And when you're able to count the colonies on a plate, you can then back calculate to, to have an estimate of how many units were in your original powder. These results are reported as colony forming units since you're counting the colonies. And while this is the standard approach to probiotic enumeration, there are some limitations. Mainly, it's very time consuming and it can take up to five days to get your results. And it provides minimal cell viability information. To overcome some of these limitations, flow cytometry has been introduced to the probiotic uh, testing realm. With flow cytometry, the cells are put into a saline solution inside of the instrument. And so you have a homogeneous mixture of all of the cells in your sample. The cells then go one at a time through the instrument and a laser passes through each cell individually 
And based on the characteristics of that cell, like cell size or cell shape, the light scatters in different ways. Different detectors capture this information based on cell type, viability, and size, based on how the light is scattering. And then specific, specific software performs data analysis based on what information the detectors are captured, leaving you with a final cell count and classification. And since each individual cell is being hit by the laser individually, you have a really accurate cell count and you have information about different characteristics like if the cells are alive, injured, or dead, as well as the type of cell in the sample. And just some notes about the results of flow cytometry. It's reported as active fluorescent units instead of colony forming units. And it provides both quantitative and qualitative data. The quantitative data being the cell counts and the qualitative data being the cell type. This method is really fast and highly accurate with turnaround times as little as one day. And there's an ISO accredited method that Anjay and David will be talking about more throughout this presentation. And with that, I will be passing it on to Anjay who will be discussing the advantages and disadvantages of this method. Great, thank you, Ellie. Um, and thank you for, for a great introduction and setting the scene for, for this technology as, a, as an alternative to a plate count enumeration. Um, for probiotic quality management. Uh, my name is Andrzej Bankowski, um, Technical Manager for Probiotics and Dietary Supplements based out of our laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, when I was digging through content for this webinar, I came across a picture of myself with the, with the flow cytometer we're running, um, slightly younger version, um, but that is, uh, that is me over there with, uh, with the instrument. Um, I've been working with flow cytometry for six years. Um, starting out with uh, method development and, and now it's a routine service offering. So uh, next slide, please. So today, uh, like Ellie mentioned, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss um, some of the advantages um, and disadvantage, disadvantages of flow cytometry um, and, and how we can um, demonstrate reliability with the measurements that we're getting. Um, so some of the classic advantages um, that we that we first um, you know observed when we were performing the method validation is that um, flow cytometry gives uh, you superior precision compared compared to plate counts. Um, in our study, we found that approximately uh, flow cytometry gives approximately one half the percent relative standard deviation compared to both cultural plate counts and a direct microscopic count. Um, as Ellie touched on, uh, faster delivery. So this is real-time enumeration data um, versus waiting um, two to three, sometimes five days for colonies to grow on a plate under incubation conditions. And of course, product integrity uh, plate counts are only able to measure viable cells based on their ability to replicate, whereas flow cytometry, specifically the method we're running is a viability assay. Um, which can discern live injured and dead cells, and that helps inform product formulation, stability, and guides development. Next slide. So, some of those advantages, you know, we need to confirm that we are able to produce them reliably, um, and doing that um, requires method validation. Um, so when we first brought uh, the instrument online and were working with the with the method, um, we needed to ensure that the data we are going to produce uh, be accurate, precise, reproducible, and the method demonstrate robustness. So this was a this wasn't um, kind of a standard validation. Uh, we, it wasn't an out of the box validation, so to speak. So uh, we were validating an ISO method 19344, um, specifically protocol B, and I'll touch on that in more detail in a few slides. Um, but then we used um, different guidance documents um, to assess, um, you know, what the analytical procedures were going to be. 
as well as what the acceptance criteria uh, we are going to use to to ensure that the method is validated for use for the enumeration of probiotic lactic acid bacteria. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, we found that flow cytometry um, um, testing compared to plate counts produced uh, approximately one half um, the percent relative standard deviation compared to plate counts. And that's related to precision analysis. Precision is the closest of agreement or degree of scatter among individual test results obtained for multiple sampling of the same homogenous preparation. Um, and our acceptance criteria for the validation was less than 15%. Um, and as you can see in the tables, um, both on the right and below, um, shows the data associated with the percent relative standard deviation for the different materials we tested for the validation, as well as the comparison of the flow cytometry values to plate count results and direct microscopic counts. Next slide. So another very important aspect um, to ensure the results that we're producing are reliable is to test the specificity of the method. Um, specificity as defined in our validation was to demonstrate the method gives reliable results when challenged with extraneous matter. Um, that extraneous matter in this situation is actually um, different um, states of cells. So what we did was take a population of live cells, um, took a portion of that and heat killed it, um, and then mixed those live and dead cells at different ratios, um, plotted those, those charts, and confirmed that the, the coefficient of variation is above the threshold we wanted to see for the acceptance criteria. Obviously, in order to produce uh, the qualitative um, information, as Ellie mentioned, um, with, with both live injured, and dead cells, we need to ensure that no matter what ratio um, of those cells are in the product that we can accurately discern them. And that's what this specificity evaluation did. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, we're running on a, on a regular basis, uh, ISO 19344 protocol B. Um, we were the first contract laboratory in the U.S. to receive ISO 17025 accreditation on this method, um, and it's been on our scope ever since, um, so six years and counting to date. Um, and just as far as like the timeline goes, we initially purchased the instrument, our first instrument, in January 2017, um, and then received that accreditation um, nine months later, or 10 months later, um, in, in November 2017. So in between that time was when we performed the validation um, and, and all the trials that are associated with adding a method to our scope um, for ISO 17025. So that, that can give you the extra assurance, you know, that what we're running will produce the, the results that you can count on um, when it comes to precision, accuracy, all the right parameters um, for probiotic potency testing. Next slide. Okay, so another key advantage that I wanted to touch on um, is, is the, uh, the idea or the concept of viable but not culturable cells. Um, so these are metabolically active, non-replicating, non-culturable, yet viable um, probiotic cells. Um, so the way that flow cytometry measures viability specifically to the protocol we're running on a routine basis is based on membrane integrity. It uses a dual nucleic acid stain. One of the stains um, can only penetrate intact cell membranes, while the other stain is able to penetrate both damaged and intact membranes. And what we end up seeing then is a differentiation in the fluorescence between live and dead cells. Um, and this is based on their membrane integrity um, versus their ability to replicate under ideal growth conditions on a petri plate, which is the you know how we measure viability for plate counts. Um, so it's a different unit of measure. Um, there's also some disadvantages that come with that, but arguably this could be considered a more representative picture um, or snapshot of the cellular population in your sample 
um, simply because play counts may not be able to pick up um, everything that is alive um, based on you know their ability to replicate because of this VBMC um, state that some cells can exist in. Um, one other portion of this to to consider um, is that you know in order to be defined as a probiotic, um, the the material or the bacteria needs to be alive in order to confer that health benefit in accordance with the definition. Um, so you could you could argue that plate count may not be able to recover everything that's considered a probiotic um, because it's not able to detect the viable but not culturable cells. Um, so this is this is a nice this is a nice aspect to the flow cytometry assay, um, and it has a number of applications um, and unique scenarios that we'll get into um, with ways that it can help um, with this sort of difference in viability measurement. Uh, next slide. All right. So some other uh, nice applications or niche applications, depending on you know what, what, how you're looking at it, um, that we use flow cytometry for on a regular basis um, is we we've extended the validation um, to look at spore materials. Um, so that uses the same protocol as the ISO standard, but it has a different sample preparation method. Um, tailored to the enumeration of spores by flow. Um, what we determined when we were um, validating that, that um, matrix extension, so to speak, was that if we have a, a mixture of bacillus coagulans and bacillus subtilis in a blend, we can actually differentiate them um, based on the way that they're uptaking the dyes um, because they end up um, they end up being showed on the dot plot as separate concentrations of live cells. Um, and this is important because um, bacillus coagulans and bacillus subtilis growth rates on petri plates um, are drastically different. So bacillus subtilis will grow quickly and spread um, potentially depending on the type of growth media you're using. And this can cause interference um, with the bacillus coagulans ability to to grow as well as difficulty um, when counting the colonies because the bacillus coagulants will be extremely small um, and the bacillus subtilis can take over a petri plate um, depending on the type of growth media and the incubation conditions used. And what, I, what you end up seeing then is, is inaccurate data that tends to skew lower than the theoretical input. Um, and we found that using flow cytometry for this blend in particular um, is a potential solution to that to that long-standing issue of being able to accurately discern and detect um, that blend of spores. Um, postbiotics are, are, uh, are a very up and coming um, topic and material in, in the probiotic industry. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with what that is, those are inanimate cells or their components that confer a health benefit to the host. Um, there's, it's, it's an umbrella term, so it can be used to detect um, you know, inactivated intact cells. Um, it can also represent cellular components, um, proteins, short, short chain fatty acids, things like that. And the the way to measure these um, is still up for discussion. But we what we found with flow cytometry is that for the intact inactivated cells, um, this is a very um, promising technology to be able to count. Um, the, these inanimate materials. Um, obviously, play count's not going to work. These cells are theoretically all dead. Uh, play count can be used as a quality control, um, you know, function to make sure that there's no viable cells, cells still remaining. But still, you know, how to quantify um, is 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 a, an important quality aspect of these materials, and and flow cytometry um, is a potential solution for those that are that are intact still are measured based on the cell number and not some other component like a protein, for example. Um, we've extended the application to um, enumerate the, the probiotic yeast Saccharomyces or VCA subspecies Boulardi um, using the same validated protocol. Um, we recently purchased a second instrument um, and this instrument has the ability to take pictures of the cells um, as they're passing through um, the, the flow cell. Um, and this 
has some uh, potential applications to assist when we're troubleshooting um, to plot plots that may look atypical. You know, we can determine whether or not that event um, looks like a cell or looks like something else, like a like a debris or some extracellular particle. Um, the example in the picture on the right shows um, different populations of E. coli, um, and you can see in the dot plots, you know, which is just your standard forward scatter, sky scatter um, measurements of size versus cell complexity, um, that there are two different populations of of standard E. coli cells, which are found closer to the y-axis because they're theoretically smaller, and then a portion um, closer to the tail of the of the dot plot, um, and that's showing these elongated E. coli cells. So one example um, that we found um, to use for for these sorts of applications, and and it's a it's a neat feature that they're continuing to upgrade and make better um, for the discernment of these these small particles. Um, and then more forward thinking, um, flow cytometry does have the ability to um, delineate species or strains with the use of antibody tagging in conjunction with the viability dyes. This is something that we're currently not doing on a regular basis, but you know we, we are exploring um, the development opportunities related to this. There is um, a lot of good literature out there to, to support this sort of evaluation. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, you know, uh, definitely um, let's connect and we can discuss potential uh, method development opportunities for that uh, particular application. Next slide. So as I touched on and, and Ellie mentioned too, um, these are different uh, measurements of viability and with different measurements come different units. So flow cytometry is the active fluorescing unit. This is events counted in a gate specific for the scatter of fluorescence characteristics of presumed live, dead, or injured cells. Um, the activity indicator in protocol B is cyto24, um, again, based on membrane integrity. Um, the other protocols in the ISO method are based on other, other cellular characteristics, so metabolism, things like that. Um, but the, the most um, common protocol is the, is the B cell membrane integrity one. Um, and then coliforian units, obviously used to estimate a number of viable and cultural bacteria based on their ability to replicate on a plate. Um, and these two units uh, are, are difficult to correlate. And that, that's one thing. Uh, next slide, uh, I'll go into more detail here. So there isn't a universal correlation between CFU and AFU. It would be lovely if there was, um, but um, the literature uh, states otherwise. So what we end up seeing is typically at time zero when a product is manufactured, the results between plate counts and, and flow cytometry are, are consistent. They're, you know, they're, they're around the same level. Um, but as the product ages, specifically under, you know, either uh, room temperature or, or stressed um, temperatures situations, you tend to see, you wind up seeing a divergence um, where the plate count, um, typically um, the, the viability of the plate count and the cells associated with that will decrease faster than the flow cytometry assay. And again, it just harkens back to the different way that we're measuring these viability. Um, it, you, you can see if you, if you keep it refrigerated or frozen, that that um, you know that relationship between flow and plate count can remain more consistent over time. But it's you know at the long term room temperature stability where you may see that divergence, um, and that divergence isn't um, correlative between different species, strains, um, things like that. So it really ends up being sort of a, a species or strain specific, product specific, and also time specific um, situation. So not to say that you couldn't establish a correlation between the two, but it would need to be on a particular material and a stability evaluation would need to be run either in real time or potentially looking at some sort of accelerated stability modeling to assess those differences and then run a lot of replicates to be able to determine statistically whether or not that's possible. And even then, you know, you need to demonstrate repeatability. So is that going to 
diverged the same way every time, even for the, you know, the same strain, different lot of material. So a lot needs to be taken into consideration there. And that's one of the biggest hurdles um, with flow cytometry kind of um, becoming more of a mainstream um, technology for the discernment uh, and potency evaluations of probiotic products. Um, because we've shown that there are a number of advantages, but in the end, it's not a plate count. Um, and and plate count is still considered the quote unquote gold standard for enumeration. Next slide. So then some other considerations to to take into account when um when you're when you're thinking about evaluating your product by flow cytometry um, for probiotic potency is that certain matrices may cause difficulties with the assay. So if you have a low concentration of probiotic cells relative to extracellular material, think like a finished food product, like a granola or something like that, it, it, it can be very difficult to parse out the probiotic cells um, when all that extracellular material is present. Really the key to getting good accurate measurements by flow cytometry is to be able to dilute um, the product to a range um, where it can be detected on the instrument in a statistically significant way, um, but also have a clean sample that's not, you know, filled with a lot of extra things that may cause interference. Also, certain ingredients and in, in finished format may show some either autofluorescence or be able to bind to the dyes that are used and again cause cause that sort of debris interference that could cause inaccuracies in these evaluations. Um, it does because of those things it does have a higher limit of detection compared to plate count um, but it should still be a conversation you know if, if you have a product that may be on the lower end of that spectrum there may be some ways that we can accommodate um, making some tweaks in the evaluation to be able to enumerate it um, such as running more um, fluid through the instrument to get the number of events we want to see to make a you know to make an uh, accurate calculation or, or a precise calculation, um, or try some other um, separation techniques um, to separate the cells from the debris. So things like differential centrifugation and things like that, we've tried with, with some success um, in trying to parse out the cells away from the other material in order to be able to evaluate it by flow. Um, and then current testing, our current routine um, offerings is a total count. So like I mentioned, we, we can't discern species or, or or even genus when it comes to lactic acid bacteria by flow cytometry, it will give you a total live, total injured, total dead count um, of your probiotic material. Next slide. So in summary, uh, before I kick it over to Dave, um, you know, we've, we've touched on the fact that flow cytometry and plate counts are different units. Um, and it's not easy to correlate the two. Precision, we, flow cytometry is superior to plate. Um, we can report live and injured with flow versus only um, viable um, uh, live uh, cells that are a bit able to replicate on a plate for a plate count. Flow cytometry is faster. Um, directly verify CFU claims can only be done with a plate count assay because that is a CFU. Touched on the viability measurement. And then the standardized method for flow cytometry um, is, is another kind of nice feature in that we can apply it to many different materials, many different strains, um, whereas the plate count evaluations, we have our own internal methods. But of course, every manufacturer has their own uh, suite of optimized methods that we need to take into consideration when we are running those evaluations. So with that, I'd like to kick it over to Dave. Thanks, Andre. Hi everyone, my name is Dave Roth. I am Business Development and Client Services Director for Europeans Microbiology, um, primarily supporting our Madison, Wisconsin-based lab, uh, same location as Andre. And so now that we've taken you through some of the background on the technology of flow cytometry, as well as some of the technical aspects of the testing itself, we thought it'd be a good idea to walk you through some, some very specific examples of how we might be able to apply it to the products for the people attending this webinar or what we're actually doing in practice today. And so I'm going to give you a few ex examples on some dummy products that we've made up um, in terms of what the results might look like and how you might use those results. So before we get into that, let's talk about what just what the applications might be. And so 
One of the main things that we have used full cytometry for um, currently is investigation of low and out of specification results. So because of the kind of the neat opportunity to look at our, are there dead cells here versus a plate count, um, that gives us an advantage in looking into results that are uh, lower out of spec and we don't know why. Um, another alternative on why we might be having a low a low result is that we're, we're just having an issue recovering those live cells out of the product and, and full cytometry can also tell us that. Um, so, or are the organisms in my product making plate, plate enumeration challenging? Is, is, there, is there something in this product that is causing a problem uh, for us in getting those, those organisms to grow on the plate? So those are all things that flow cytometry can help with. Um, we can also look at uh, other products that are microencapsulated, for example, or the postbiotics that Andre mentioned, uh, and we'll go through an example of each of those. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about verification of label clearance, because ultimately that's where everybody would really like to get to uh, with flow cytometry because of many of the advantages from precision to speed, speed of testing uh, that Andre mentioned as well. So next slide, please. All right, so here's our, here's our first example. Um, so we've called this product the Super Gut Health Probiotic Capsule, um, and the customer is having a issue with low counts. So we're looking to uh, confirm a result of 10 billion CFD per serving or higher, of course, uh, which is the label claim. Now the customer has formulated in a good way, they've added some overage, so, that, so they actually added about 12 billion per serving in this particular example. Now, however, we're, we're getting results back that are significantly below the specification. So we've got a 4.5, a 5.2, 4.1, and 4.8 billion CFU per serving. So we're we're coming in at roughly half of, of what we would have expected to get back out of this product. And so as the customer, when we give you this uh, plate count result, um, which, we, which we do on a regular basis, um, the question might become, okay, what happened here? Is there an issue with the test? Is there an issue with the product? Uh, or, or what overall happened. And so we might then suggest that you go ahead and do a full cytometry test. Um, and we have an example results here for that as well. So in this, in this particular case. And so here we have a, a 4.8 billion AFU live cell result, 1.3 injured and 6.1 dead. So you can see that there are, the cells are there. So the product was formulated appropriately, but we've had a die off issue. So perhaps there was uh, an issue with the shipment of the product, or something happened in the manufacturer that caused those, those cells to die. But we are able to show that the product was made correctly in terms of having enough cells present. However, it just, they aren't alive anymore. And so this product is not going to meet the label claim. All right, next slide. Now here's another example of a low, of a low count. And we're calling this one the Yummy Gummy Kids Probiotic uh, with a spec of 20 billion CFU per serving. And so we're trying to hit that label claim. Uh, again, the, the formulator uh, did their job, and so we have 24 billion was actually added. So we have a little bit of overage to work with here, but we're coming in right under the spec. We have 17 billion, 19, 18, and 16 billion uh, because this customer, of course, did, did the retesting to see if the original result was valid. Um, now, in this case, though, however, the results are opposite by full cytometry. So we are showing that we have met the label claim at 22 billion AFU live cells here uh, by the full cytometry. 1.3 billion injured and 0.5 billion dead. So, so very few dead cells. So we can show here that the product should be meeting this back and that we likely have either a recovery issue or an issue with the plate count method that is preventing us from getting to that specification value. So you might then go down a path of trying to improve the methodology or looking at a different methodology if you are really wanting to have a CFU plate count result to support your product release. Um, the one alternative here, though, is that you may have some viable but not culturable cells that are also present in the product, as Anjay mentioned, that can be picked up by the flow cytometry that would not be able to grow and replicate and make a colony on a plate. So that's just one thing to think about as well when you're going down this particular path. All right, next slide. All right. So our next product here is called Very Berry Bacillus Biotic. And you heard Anjay mention that sometimes blends of bacillus products can be particularly challenging when it comes to growth on a plate. That normally has to do with the bacillus subtilis being a fast grower and a spreader on the plate and causing issues with enumerating the other bacillus that have to be present. However, this is a pretty common blend of probiotic materials that we see on the market. And so full cytometry can come in handy there. So as this example, we have 
a spec of or a label claim of 30 billion total, uh, 15 billion of each for bacillus subtilis and bacillus coagulans. Um, and the formulator again did their job at 18 billion CFU per serving added to the product of each bacillus species. Now our result is coming back just below the spec. Um, and in most cases, we're going to be reporting by plate count a total count of the bacillus that are present. So in this case, we reported 26 billion CFU per serving. Now the customer went ahead and did the flow cytometry uh, to see if that might be what's causing the issue that we had some fast growing bacillus that prevented some counting of the other bacillus coagulans that was present. And it turns out that that was the case. We were able to report back by flow cytometry that we had 18 billion AFU preserving of the coagulants and 17 billion of the subtilis. So we've met both the 15 billion specifications and the product is able to say that it met the label claim. Now, again, this is an AFU count versus a CFU count, but we are able to differentiate between the two, which is a really nice feature of the flow cytometry and that you're able to report both the coagulants and the subtilis separately as well uh, by the full cytometry and show that the label claim was met. Next slide. All right. So what about when your cells are stressed out? And this, in this particular case, we're calling it the bubbly vivid, pro, vivid probiotic cola. But this could really be applicable to uh, many different product types in which we're starting to see traditional lactobacillus and bifidobacterium put into product formats, which they haven't been used previously. And the way that many of the customers are approaching that is through encapsulation technology. And so by encapsulating the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, we're able to put them into products or the formulators are able to put them into products that traditionally they would not have. So these would be things like gummies or colas or different drinks that might be a UHT. And so those cells are being stressed through the heat in the manufacturing process um, and the microencapsulation is protecting them, but it does make them harder to enumerate uh, post-product manufacturing. So for this particular case, uh, we have 12 billion CFU per serving of microencapsulated bifidobacterium. There were 16 billion initially added, so we do have some overage uh, in trying to hit that 12 billion CFU per serving spec. But because of the processing, we're only getting back 1 billion CFU per serving as a play count result. So we're not even close to having met that spec. However, by using full cytometry, we are able to show that we met this spec in that there were lots of viable but not transferable cells in this particular product. Uh, we have 12.5 billion AFU per serving live cells that showed up in the full cytometry, 2.5 injured and 1 billion dead. So you see here that there is a pretty big difference between the plate count and the full cytometry result, mostly due to that viable not cultural situation that we've talked a little bit about. Um, and the full cytometry is a viable method for enumerating these cells. Next slide. All right, but what about if your product is dead? So we've talked a little bit earlier in the, sh in the slideshow about postbiotics, and this is an area we're continuing to see increased inquiries. Um, and if any of you attended probiotic last week, it was a large topic of conversation there as well. And full cytometry was mentioned as one of the main areas or main methods by which these the postbiotics could potentially be enumerated. So we're calling this one the poster child postbiotics. since it's a new and exciting area we're testing. And so th there are two different ways that, that you might potentially label a postbiotic. One would be with the milligrams present. So I have 250 milligrams using in this particular example, but also 25 billion per serving heat inactivated lactobacillus cells. So we're not gonna be able to measure the milligrams by both cytometry, but we can measure the heat inactivated cells uh, is assuming that they are still intact cells. And so in this particular case, the formula, formulator put in 28 billion. Our formulators are all pretty good. They're all using a nice amount of overage. Uh, but because they were all dead cells, the plate count would show less than 10 CFU per serving. It would be a little bit alarmed if we saw something different here because we know that they're supposed to be dead. Um, however, by using full cytometry, we are able to report a very high death count of 26 billion CFU per serving and that we met that spec of 25 billion per serving. So we're showing here that we've met, met our spec for the amount of postbiotics present in the product. Next slide. All right, so the final area to discuss is, of course, 
label claim verification. So there are customers that are in the market today that are using flow cytometry for label claim verification and product release. We've put a dummy uh, picture here of what a supply fax panel might look like when labeled an AFU for serving. And there are a few that are in the market today that if you went out and looked for them, you would see that they are out there uh, labeled in AFU for serving. Um, there's also another way that some customers are looking at this, and if they're not making a specific CFU claim, they could potentially use an AFU result to report or to support a claim of something like billions of live cells, uh, which you will see as a, a little blurb on many, many products in the marketplace as well. I can think of a couple of yogurt uh, samples, for example, or, or yogurt products, for example, that are out there with that type of a, a label claim. And so it is starting to become more common to see products that are tested by flow cytometry that are uh, on the market either actively marketed as AFU per serving or supporting other claims such as the billion live cells. Now the key here is that you want to be able to show substantial proof that the measured dose enumerated by flow cytometry is the same as the measured dose used in the clinical trial associated with any health claims that you're making about that specific product. If you're interested in having a, a more detailed discussion about this particular topic, we have had many conversations of this kind with, with customers that are looking to use this test methodology to support specific product release or product needs or product claims. So we're happy to have those, have, happy to have those types of discussions. Next slide. All right, so this is the final slide. Um, and here are things that we hope that you learned today. Um, so we have shown that flow cytometry is a reliable alternative uh, for the enumeration of probiotic bacteria. The precision is better, the speed is better. It is also fully validated at our lab and on our ISO scope of 17025 uh, for the last six years, as Anjay mentioned to you. Um, and it does have several advantages over the plate counts. Precision, viable population discernment, can be used for dead cells. Uh, it can also be used as an investigative tool as I, as I went through a few of those examples. And so you, you can answer a lot of questions that a plate count might not be able to tell you just because it's not giving you information about injured cells, viable or not culturable cells, or even dead cells. So it is a valuable tool, even if you're not using it specifically for release, which is the uh, end goal, I believe, uh, for many of our customers because of some of the advantages for flow cytometry. So with that, thank you. And I guess it's uh, time for questions. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation today. Yes, we have had a lot of questions um, come into the chat, so I'll go ahead um, and start asking those. Um, the first one here um, that has come in, do you offer services to develop and validate flow cytometry testing methods for a specific or unique product? The answer to that question is yes, um, and we have worked with several manufactured of both product probiotic strains as well as probiotic products um, to develop unique probiotic me testing methodology by flow cytometry uh, and to validate that methodology to be able to offer to both them and or if it's a, a formulator of raw materials to their ultimate customers for the products that they're putting that into. Great, thanks for that, Dave. Anything else to add on that one, Anjay, you're pretty good there. Yeah, I mean, the, the methods are typically uh, derivations of our of our standard method that may require a different sample preparation or something like that. Um, so that is something we do on a routine basis, similar to what we do with plate counts and and looking at method optimization, things like that. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Next question here: um, What challenges do you face when when testing postbiotic materials by flow cytometry, and what considerations should be taken into account when testing postbiotic materials by flow cytometry? Sure, I can I can take that one. Um, and I touched on it a little bit, um, but you know the, the main consideration for postbiotics, and like I said, it's an umbrella term, so it, you know, the the, the term can mean a variety of things um, and we need to confirm whether it makes sense to test the product by flow cytometry based on what it is that is providing the health benefit because in the end in order to be called a postbiotic it needs to have a health benefit associated with that um, so if it's um, the intact inanimate cell um, and we don't necessarily know the exact mechanism, but we know that it's an inactivated cell. 
pulse cytometry could give you accurate and reliable results. If the product is um, you know, completely obliterated into, into just the extracellular material, and, um, and, and we still may not know the mechanism, but we know that it's you know, just cellular material and no intact cells left, then you may start seeing some inaccuracies when trying to evaluate by flow cytometry. And of course, if the mechanism is known and it's not you know, something like a cell, um, whether it's you know, a metabolite or some sort of other uh, material, a protein or you know, something else that's demonstrated the health, the health effect, then that particular thing should be measured by a different application, whether it's you know NMR or, or some other uh, like LCMS or something something like that. Um, so the, you know those are the main considerations to take. It really comes down to the format of the product because a postbiotic can be uh, any number of things. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, then the next question that has come in: Do you expect flow cytometry to one day replace plate count enumerations as the gold standard for for probiotic potency testing? Um, not right away. No. Um, it it shows some advantages, but there are some big hurdles to overcome. Um, for getting, you know, uh, sort of a paradigm shift away from plate counts to something like flow cytometry or another technology such as, you know, quantitative PCR or things like that. And you have um, different researchers looking at, um, you know, different platforms as a as the alternative or the next thing beyond plate counts. Um, in my opinion, it, you know, it, I think eventually you know, just with the advantages it brings um, that there could be one day, but it's, I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon. And I think plate counts and everything associated with them, whether it's the clinical trials or the regulations, things that are very difficult to repeat and very difficult to, to get changed, um, will keep those as the, as the gold standard for, for, you know, a while to come yet. But I hope that maybe someday, you know, there may be a shift um, and what that may be, whether it's flow or DPCR or something else that we haven't, you know, that we haven't figured out yet um, as, as a potential replacement. Great. Thanks for that insight. And I know we have been, just, oh, go ahead, David. I was just going to add there that I, I would say that we have seen a start of an increase in terms of the flow cytometry requests that we're getting in, the number of tests we're running on a regular basis. And so, so there has been a, a little bit of a shift already to flow cytometry, certainly hasn't taken over for, for the plate counts, but there is an increase and I think we're starting to see that. Great, thank you. And it looks like we are getting more questions in here and um, we probably have time for about two or three more questions. I know, um, again, I just mentioned this, that if we don't answer all your questions today, we will follow up offline. Uh, but the next question here, um, how long does it take to develop applications uh, for new um, probiotics? I, I presume they're, they're meaning like a new test method um, or something like that. Um, method development, I mean, it really, it really depends on, you know, the, the exact circumstance, um, but turnaround time for those, you know, if we're starting from scratch, can be a few months, um, three to six months. Um, if we already have an established method and we're looking to alter it in some way, you know, uh, maybe four to eight weeks, depending, but it, re it really does depend on, on the specific, um, you know, request and, and what is all encompassing that. Our standard validation, you know, method validation turnaround time is, is four to six weeks, um, but that's for, for plate counts. So yeah, it really depends. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, then the next question here, is there a difference in accuracy between which kind of products such as cheese, yogurt, meat are measured with flow cytometers? Yeah, um, I mean that in general, when you're when you're putting um, probiotics in a in a finished food or a food product, fortified food, um, what we've seen is that um, 
it is dependent on the manufacturing process to ensure uh, homogeneity um, between samplings and between lots and things like that. And that's a critical aspect of it, specific for accuracy. Um, but as far as flow cytometry, it really comes down to the, the potency of the probiotics. Um, so, you know, if we're above 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, we're typically going to get pretty accurate results by flow. Um, once we start getting down 10 and 6, 10 and 5 in these finished food matrices, that's when we may start to see some interference and potentially some inaccuracies that we may be able to mitigate um, depending on the product. Again, this would be a, a specific sort of study designed uh, for a particular matrix where one may be part somewhat easier than the other to accommodate. Um, so that, that's, yeah, accuracy in a nutshell. And then in precision, in, in our experiences, is that, you know, um, precision is typically um, higher or lower relative standard deviation um, for things like raw lyophilized materials. And then it can kind of expand, um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a food product, we typically see higher RSDs um, in general. But again, depending on the manufacturing process. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then I think I'm just monitoring here. I think we have time for one more question. Um, if CFU and AFU cannot be correlated, what method is acceptable for probiotic release? Sure. Um, that's really going to depend on the country um, that you're that you're releasing the product to. Um, since we're based in the United States, I can speak for the United States and the FDA. Uh, and that they their recommendations still for probiotics um, or the regulations associated with probiotic release criteria is to state the value in milligrams. Um, anyone that's in industry knows that that's not really a correct representation of the material um, because different strains can have different concentrations of cells by weight. Um, so there is a guidance document that FDA published a number of years ago um, that state, along with milligrams, you can also put um, CFUs on your label. Um, they also note in that guidance document that they are looking at alternative technologies and their applications for these sorts of, of um, label claims. Um, in the end, and, 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 and we touched on this you know, during the presentation, um, if you're going to put a label claim that is based on a live cell by flow cytometry um, and, or, or something else besides a CFU, um, you know, it, you're able to do that as long as you can substantiate um, that claim um, and tying it back to the, the efficacy study associated with that if there is a claim for um, you know, a health benefit. Um, so the, the, the regulation is um, it allows you that flexibility, but there needs to be scientific justification um, as to why you're doing it. We do see some some products that are are using AFU on the on the label or something like live cells is a common way uh, because that's a very consumer friendly nomenclature um, um, and that that you know a consumer may not know what a CFU is, but uh, a live cell is something they can they can relate with. So that's a you know, something to consider. Great. Okay. Thank you for that, Anjay. Yeah, and it looks like we're coming up close to the end here um, again. So as I reminded, if we did not address your question um, live today, we will certainly follow up with you after. I also invite you to take just the three question survey um, that will immediately follow once you close the webinar today. And again, I want to thank our presenters. Um, thank, ev thank everyone for attending and you will receive a copy of the presentation as well as the recording within three business days. So thank you very very much for tuning in today and thanks again to our presenters. Thank you. Thank Have a good day everyone. You too. Cheers.